today I'm going to tell you two stories um, about our efforts to understand remodeling chromatin in cancer. And I'm going to start with our melanoma work. So we've been studying melanoma biology um, for 15 years now in the laboratory. And this is a very aggressive and uh, lethal disease when it metastasizes. It's a disease that originates in the melanocytes, which are uh, the pigment cells in our skin that protect us from uh, UV damage. And um, again, we've been studying this in different aspects of melanoma biology, just to kind of walk you through some of our, our work, um, which revolves around um, understanding in, in a very detailed manner, the chromatin mechanisms regulating processes like cellular senescence, where cells uh, eff effectively arrest, as you can see in these benign nevi, which stay uh, for the lifetime of an organism on the body without necessarily turning into a primary melanoma or further development of disease. So this is a very interesting state of chromatin. We've also studied um, the changes that occur, as John mentioned, from normal melanocytes to um, melanoma. We've mapped the epigenome, discovered enhancer elements and genes that are regulated by these enhancer elements as novel drivers in melanoma that are not necessarily mutated. We've also worked in uncovering epigenetic factors that play a role in the resistance to targeted therapies. So uh, melanoma has really been the poster child for many um, new therapies that have evolved over the past 10 years or so, including MAP kinase inhibitor therapies. Uh, those targeted therapies, as you can see here, um, effectively were curing patients, but resistance became a very large problem. Of course, immunotherapy is another one that we're very interested in. Um, and more molecularly, um, the laboratory for many years now has been um, very excited about histone variant biology and the chaperones that place histone variants into the chromatin template. As we all know, these are highly mutated in cancer, and we've learned a lot about these um, mutations over the years, particularly uh, histone H3.3 mutations as an oncohistone in pediatric uh, glioma. And what I'm going to talk about today is a very recent story where we have worked towards understanding chromatin remodeling mutations in melanoma, particularly of the PVAF complex. So the first story uh, revolves around our two mutations in melanoma and understanding their role. Um, this is uh, a story that's driven in large part by two wonderful PhD students who've recently graduated and moved on uh, in their careers, Saul, Saul Carcamo and Christine Nguyen, who um, really spearheaded this work. So just a review of um, the SWISNF complexes, and um, I think many of you are familiar with uh, these complexes. There's many subunits, um, and for the purpose of this talk, I'm really going to be focusing on the PBAF and the BAF uh, complexes. There's another complex, a smaller one called GBAF, that was recently identified. Um, and in the case of melanoma, as I mentioned, there are high-frequency mutations, particularly in a subunit called ARID2. And um, for the, again, for the purpose of the talk, the PBAF-specific members of the complexes will be highlighted in green, and those in the BAF complex, such as SS18 and others, will be highlighted in blue. And of course, there's many shared subunits in these complexes, such as the ATPases, which are responsible for moving nucleosomes around, such as BRG1. So again, these subunits will be highlighted throughout the talk, uh, just in color coding to keep everybody in check which complexes uh, I'm referring to. Now, why did we get interested in ARIN2 in the first place? So um, many years back, in fact, through genomic sequencing studies in melanoma, there had been multiple genetic subtypes that had been well characterized, such as the BRAF, the RAS, the NF1, and the triple wild type. Um, but what you can see is that ARIN2 mutations are quite frequent, frequent. In this cohort, it's 14%. In some other cohorts, as high as 20% of melanomas which in fact is about the same rate as the genetic subtype NF1, which is approximately 14% as well. And this is thought to be tumor suppressive, mainly due to the fact that missense and um, truncating mutations are highly pre prevalent in the ARIN2 uh, locus. So to try to understand this, um, Saul had initiated a study by collecting some cell lines that were annotated as ARID2 uh, mutant, either heterozygous or homozygous um, mutations. And what you can see here very clearly is that those that are in this maroon color, which are annotated for ARID2 mutations, we have a destabilization or a loss of the protein as indicated here. 
But interestingly, we also noted that some of the other PBAF specific members, such as PBRM1 and BRD7, were also lost in this ARID2 mutant setting, um, as opposed to BAF specific members or uh, uh, core shared members that were not disturbed in these lines. So we wanted to model this and we created knockouts by CRISPR-Cas9 in SKML147, which is a melanoma cell line that's really the workhorse of the lab. We have an extremely large data set of epigenomics and high C data for. And you can see very nicely when we lose ARID2, we also lose um, another subunit of the PBAF complex, PBRM1. This is in the whole cell and also in the chromatin template, whereas the other members of these complexes were not affected. And this led us to question um, the stability of the PBAF complex in the absence of ARID2. So again, taking the parental line or the non-targeting control, which in this case is um, a wild type non-edited clone and our knockout lines for ARID2, what you can see if we pull down BRG1, a core shared subunit of these complexes is that we can uh, IP SNF5, another shared member, we can IP ARID1A, suggesting that the BAF complex is indeed intact, but the PBAF complex is not, as we don't pull down ARID2 or PBRM1. And this is not a transcriptional effect, because if we look at the expression of these um, SWISNF complex members across uh, the wild type and ARID2 knockout setting, you can see that the transcriptional um, uh, levels of these subunits are not affected. So this suggested that um, potentially there's destabilization or loss of the complex. And this has actually been shown uh, previously that ARID2 is required by Segal and others that ARID2 is, uh, or the ARIDs in general import, are very important for complex assembly. So we teamed up um, to ask what happens to the complexes at large um, with Emily Dykhausen, um, who is an expert in SWISNF complexes to perform glycerol gradient analysis. And so when we do this, and this has also been characterized as a, an assay to separate these complexes based on density, uh, the ARID2 P BRD7, so the PBAF members are the heaviest in this glycerol gradient. Here are the BAF uh, members, uh, SS18 is here, it's just a bit faint. And when we go ahead and perform the same analysis in the knockout setting for ARID2, of course, ARID2 and BRD7 are not here any longer. Um, but what was interesting is that these core shared subunits such as SNF5 and BRG1 were also lost, really suggesting that this complex, the PBAF complex really falls apart uh, in the absence of PBAF. And we did note that there was a slight shift of these uh, complex members from the PBAF into the BAF complex as shown here uh, by quantification that these uh, shared subunits SNF5 and BRG1 are somewhat enriched now in the BAF. Uh, uh, fractions. So we wanted to understand at baseline, what do these um, different SWISNF complexes look like in melanoma as this hadn't really been investigated. And as you can see here, ARID2, uh, this is chip sequencing data, ARID2, of course, um, helps us to delineate the PBAF specific um, sites in the genome, but also a set of sites that are shared between PBAF and BAF. And we used SS18 as a core, um, as a specific member of the BAF complex to help us identify the BAF specific and the shared sites and BRG1, of course, which is in both complexes across all sites. And what we noted is that um, the PBAF and the shared uh, uh, clusters here are highly enriched uh, in K4ME3 and K27-acetyl, as well as a TAC-seq signal, suggesting these are found mainly in promoter regions while the BAF uh, complex in melanoma is mainly uh, enriched, as you can see here, uh, H3K4, ME1, and K27 acetyl positive regions also uh, for open chromatin, suggesting these are more enhancer regions. And this has also been shown by others in the field uh, for BAF localizing to enhancers. Uh, if we look then at um, the specific transcription factors underlying these sites, of course, predicted, uh, they do seem to have some shared, but also some unique uh, transcription factors associated with them. In particular, the PBAF only cluster uh, seems to be enriched for a transcription factor we've been very interested in for years called REST, um, as well as others that are shared across the complexes, uh, such as CTCF across all three. Whereas the AP1, uh, or in this case, FOSL2, which we'll come back to in a bit, was really enriched in these shared and BAF uh, sites. 
Of course, these are only predictions. So we went ahead to look uh, by chip sequencing where rest and other uh, transcription factors are sitting across these three clusters. And um, lo and behold, the chip seek actually uh, held true to our predictions. So rest, uh, again, I'll come back to this transcription factor later, is predominantly found in the PBAF only clusters, CTCF across all clusters, and the AP1 transcription factor fossil 2 in the shared in the BAF uh, clusters. And um, we are now um, moving forward in the lab to try and understand this sort of specificity of this rest transcription factor at the PBAF sites. And this is uh, ongoing work um, by Elena Grossi in the lab. So now we really wanted to understand, so that's sort of the baseline setting, but what happens in the absence of ARID2? So if the PBAF complex, which is a chromatin remodeling complex, falls apart, we expect that uh, genomic sites will be uh, differentially accessible in the absence of the PBAF complex. And so what we see here is just the uh, attack seek signal in the absence of uh, ARID2, these knockout lines where we have attack increased signal as well as decreased signal. And what's interesting is that when we mapped ARID2 signal across these sites, we see that the ARID2 at baseline is mainly at those sites that are decreased. So ARID2 really seems to be helping keep uh, chromatin open. And in the absence of ARID2, these sites tend to close, whereas the sites that are increased were very sort of interesting to us because they were not ARID2 enriched. So if we look at where the ATAC increase and decrease sites are actually happening across these three cl clusters that we had mapped, while not so unexpected, the decreased sites, as I just showed you, had ARID2. Um, so these are either the PBAF or the shared regions that tend to close in accessibility, but the regions that opened were predominantly the BAF sites. So in the absence of PBAF, the BAF-specific sites um, tend to open up uh, accessibility-wise. Okay, so what actually happens if we look at some of these signals um, comparing the open chromatin, so the ATAC signal versus, for example, SS18. And what we found was that those sites that are now opening in the absence of PBAF gain SS18 signal and those sites that close will lose it. And again, those sites that open gain K27 acetylation and those sites that close um, will lose it. And that's not so unexpected. Um, here's what this looks like. Uh, from the browser track. So if we have a shared site that's both bound uh, by PBAF and BAF complexes, and you can see here uh, the ARID2 signal, this is a promoter. As I mentioned, the PBAF and the shared sites tend to be at promoters. Uh, in the absence of ARID2, we lose the attack signal, we lose K27 acetylation, and we lose uh, SS18 binding. At sites that gain accessibility, uh, which are mainly, again, enhancers. They're devoid of ARID2. These are BAF-specific sites. We gain attack signal, K27 acetyl signal, as well as SS18 signal. So this suggests maybe that the BAF, the BAF complex redistributes in the absence of PBAF. So we wanted to understand a bit more about these uh, open sites, and we plotted these ATAC increased and decreased signals in um, this, again, workhorse cell line in the laboratory, this melanoma cell line, SKML147. And when we did this, we found that predominantly the AP1 uh, transcription factors, which I had mentioned earlier, um, were enriched in the opening and closing sites. And in fact, um, we mapped these transcription factors. We mapped FOSL2 as a representative AP1 factor, as well as TED4 for reasons that will become clear uh, in a moment. Um, and again, we saw that the sites that gain uh, accessibility will gain these transcription factors, and the sites that lose accessibility lose the transcription factors. And we also mapped the SS18 signal as shown here in, in the colors across these opening and closing sites. So the sites that tend to gain BAF complex are also gaining these transcription factors. Now, again, this was one cell line, and I should say a lot of this data was recapitulated in multiple melanoma cell lines. But very interestingly, when we looked at the attack signal in a different melanoma cell line, we found very different transcription factors. So the 501 mel cell line is quite different. Um, in the field of melanoma, we have uh, multiple sort of states, uh, of phenotypic states that are called the proliferative or the invasive state. And it just so happens that 
SKML147 is considered more of an invasive cell line, and 501 mel is more of a proliferative one. And in this case, the transcription factors were quite different, whereas here we see now the lineage-specific uh, melanocyte transcription factors, MITF and SOX10, being predominant in these changing sites. And again, we chip-seeked uh, MITF, and we could see that those sites that are opening uh, by accessibility or gaining this uh, master transcription factor uh, of melanoma called MITF. So this really sort of opened our eyes to what these chromatin remodelers may be doing, uh, at least in the context of melanoma. And I think as a field, it's becoming um, more clear across multiple diseases that these may be affecting cellular states. So again, in melanoma, there's really these two behaviors um, called the proliferative and the invasive states, or this phenotype switching that's interconvertible. Um, these states can sort of go back and forth. And it's known, um, we didn't discover this, it's known for many years that MITF and SOX10 are predominant in the proliferative state. And more recently, the AP1 and the TED family members have been implicated in uh, the invasive state. So as I showed you, we really had two representative uh, cell lines of each of these states suggesting that um, really the ARID2 or the PBAF uh, complex is regulating accessibility to transcription factors uh, depending on the predominant transcription factors in those cells. And you can see that uh, here, if we look at the MITF levels in 501 mal, it's much higher than in 147 as expected, whereas the FOSL2 and TED4 uh, transcription factors are uh, more highly expressed in the invasive uh, melanoma cell line. So putting this all together, um, we had also performed, I'm not showing the data here, but we had also performed high C analysis uh, together with our Sirigos' lab at NYU and uh, called TADS. And so we were able to associate uh, genes that were changing to an uh, associated ATAC, ATAC site within, within 500 KB and, and also within a TAD. So it helped us to call uh, the enhancers a bit more clearly. Um, but again, here you can see um, we've mapped the RNA-seq and the attack within these TADs, uh, showing you the gene expression uh, changes across the parental and non-targeting wild type controls versus the knockouts. And uh, if we look at the genes now that fit all these criteria um, and their pathways, we um, very often actually see this uh, synapse um, upregulation uh, across melanoma cell lines. And that's something that we're continuing to uh, work on. But for the purpose of this talk, one of the main pathways upregulated was this response to trans transforming growth, fa growth factor beta or TGF beta which we thought was very interesting because it's been implicated in melanoma cell invasion. So when we look at the genes in this uh, signature, this response to TGF beta, these are now upregulated in the ARID2 knockout setting. You can see many genes that have, um, as a field in melanoma, been implicated as drivers of the invasive phenotype. So that includes the SMADs, uh, the TGF beta R2 receptor, WINF5A is a classical invasion gene in melanoma. Um, shown by Ashi, uh, we are not, we are, sorry, I always mess up her name, uh, Ashi, I'll leave it at that. Um, and so we wanted to look at whether our signature correlated with uh, the invasive signatures that had been shown in melanoma previously. So we mapped our genes onto the invasive signature by Verfi et al. in 2015. And we had a very strong correlation with those genes that had been defined as an invasive signature in both melanoma cell lines, as well as patient samples, again, uh, SMAD3 and others. And we validated these in the knockout setting, uh, also at the protein level. So you can see increased phosphosmad 3 uh, here. Okay, so what does this actually mean for melanoma biology? Um, we did many assays. I'm not going to show you all of them here. We uh, used two uh, in vivo settings to understand uh, our two function, including um, the CAM model, which is the chicken embryo model, where we can grow tumors and uh, allow dissemination into the chicken embryo. But for the purpose of today, I'm just going to show you some of the tail vein assays uh, to look for metastatic um, dissemination of melanoma cells in the mouse. So if we assay the lungs um, upon a tail vein injection in the context of the non-targeting control, and the hour two knockout setting, we have an increase uh, 
in the lung colonies, um, as you can see here. So here are the images of some of these lungs where you can see uh, very nicely, these are labeled so you can see the, the signal uh, in the knockout setting here. And also by um, h &E staining, you can see the, the lung really filled here with these melanoma cells versus uh, the wild type non-targeting non control. But what was very interesting about this and may not be fully appreciated by the images is that while there were um, many more colonies um, in these lungs, they were actually quite small. So these, this is now looking at the, air, the average area of these colonies in the knockout setting. And this is really indicative of this switch. So these cells now have switched from proliferative to invasive and now are lodging in the lungs, but staying in this invasive state until potentially they receive signals to start proliferating again. So this really suggested that this signature we found in the hour two knockout setting is allowing these cells to become more invasive and to colonize the lung in animals. And so um, with that, I'm just going to um, propose the model that we put forth, which um, we're still really exploring. But in the case of um, the ARID2 knockout setting, when we lose ARID2, it's very clear that we lose this PBAF complex. And biochemically, I think we've shown that uh, quite nicely. Now, what happens to these subunits um, is somewhat unclear. We did see some potential movement in the glycerol gradient, suggesting that some of these core subunits may be available now for formation of additional BAF complexes, although um, it's, it's still under investigation. But the idea is that these sites that are either bound by the PBAF complex alone or shared with BAF, these sites tend to close in the absence of ARA2. Um, and these were pathways that were downregulated, mainly involving metabolism. And this has been shown um, before in melanoma in the context of ARID2 loss. So we don't quite know what this means yet. However, the BAF locations gain accessibility, gain transcription factor binding. And these are enhancer elements that um, via genomic analysis drive um, expression of genes involved in invasion path pathways, um, as I showed you before. And this has consequences on uh, melanoma biology as shown by the metastasis assays. And I will say, I didn't have time to show you, we don't see any effect on primary tumor growth. So this really suggests that these alterations are, dry, are driving this uh, invasion of metastasis phenotype. Okay, so with that, I'm going to switch gears and talk about another chromatin remodeling project in the laboratory in the context of neuroblastoma. Uh, most of the work I'll show you today is published, and this was really led by a very talented graduate student, Zuleika Kadir, who's now um, at UCSF continuing her career in the context of pediatric uh, oncology. And um, more recently, uh, Zina Yostas and Anisha Cook have really driven this project forward, um, and we're really excited about continuing these studies uh, in the context of neuroblastoma. So just very briefly, I'll give you an overview of uh, neuroblastoma biology. It's uh, maybe not as common of a cancer that's studied. It is a pediatric cancer of the uh, extracranial nervous system. So this is not a brain tumor. Um, it often arises in the adrenal gland or the, or the spinal nerve root. Um, and actually, the younger you are, the better um, uh, survival you have. So uh, this is a disease of very early uh, children, in fact, infants. And um, it's quite a remarkable disease in that sometimes, in fact, there's spontaneous regression of these tumors. So the younger you are, the more favorable outcome you have. Um, a bit older, uh, these children tend to have metastatic disease, very often um, accompanied by amplifications in the MYC N gene. So this is quite classical um, oncogene in the context of neuroblastoma. Um, but more recently, um, Mike Dyer and, and Nai Kong Chung and others and Jan Molinar have shown, again, through sequencing studies that in the older cohort of these children, which is a more rare but indolent and um, lethal neuroblastoma, ATRX alterations are quite um, common. And this is, again, much more of an unfavorable prognosis, and there's no uh, targeted therapies for these patients. And um, in the older subsetting of um, neuroblastoma, somewhere up to 50% of these patients will harbor an ATRX alteration. So what is ATRX? So I told you a lot about ARID2, which is a component of the very large SWISNF complex. Uh, ATRX is another chromatin remodeler. Um, here's its structure. 
And um, it's, it is a, a Weiss-Smith-like helicase, and it has um, the ability to um, move nucleosomes. However, at the N-terminus, it has very interesting chromatin binding modules, uh, including an ADD domain, which binds to K9 trimethyl on H3, uh, predicted EZH2 interaction domain. We showed also an interaction with the histone variant macro H2A at this N-terminus. Um, an HP1 interacting domain, as well as its DAX interacting domain. And so together with DAX, ATRX um, and DAX together can help to deposit histone H3.3 into heterochromatin. So why is this interesting? Well, what really caught our eye is the fact that ATRX is highly mutated, uh, particularly in the pediatric setting. So uh, in um, uh, glioblastomas of children, uh, low-grade gliomas of adolescents and young adults, as well as neuroblastoma. And um, what Nikon and Jan Molnar had shown actually was that what's classical in neuroblastoma is not necessarily mutations, although they do exist, but these in-frame deletions. So effectively, a large chunk of this locus will be deleted. And this, this locus can now actually form an in-frame fusion, making a functional protein product, although nobody had really characterized that at the time. So as chromatin biologists, we were very interested in these large deletions because it basically takes out all of the chromatin binding modules at the end terminus of ATRX. Um, and sometimes you're left with a protein that's either the DAX binding domain with the helicase or even just the helicase on its own. So it loses the ability to recognize chromatin. We thought that was really fascinating. So Zuleika went ahead and screened um, tons and tons of neuroblastoma cell lines and uh, PDX models, anything we could get our hands on. And she was able to characterize two cell lines called SKNMM and CHLA90 um, that had these deletions. So these are indicated by these black bars. And you can see by amplifying uh, the cDNA, here's the full length ATRX cDNA. These are um, much smaller uh, cDNAs. But the question is, what does this protein actually, these new in-frame fusion protein products do in the genome? And I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, here's just characterization of these two cell lines. One is female and ATRX, the X stands for, uh, on the X chromosome. So in females, there's two copies. And uh, in the case of the MM cell line, we have a fusion on one allele and a point mutation on the other allele, which is very common also seen in patients that there's no functional ATRX um, locus uh, remaining. And in the male setting, we have a two to 10 fusion which again removes a large part of this N-terminal region. So what do these look like in the chromatin fraction? So here we're, we're performing ATRX Western blot. Uh, you can see the wild type. We use two age and stage matched uh, neuroblastoma lines for these studies. It is present in the chromatin fraction, although at uh, much lower levels, but it is present. Um, and what was very interesting is that it has a very different behavior than the wild type. So this line here, SKNFI, is from an older patient, but it has wild type for ATRX. And we know that ATRX is a heterochromatin binding protein. Um, a large fraction of it is found actually in the insoluble pellet. It's very difficult to work with this protein because of that. Um, whereas the in-frame fusion proteins are much more soluble. They come out of chromatin already at 150 millimolar salt. And again, you can extract them at 600 uh, millimolar. So this is a much more soluble um, uh, fusion protein. If we look by immunofluorescence, um, we see that ATRX is sitting in these loci as indicated by these, you can see these smaller um, boxes at the bottom together with HP1 alpha. Uh, here is the merge. However, in the case of these in-frame fusions, there's a much more diffuse ATRX signal. We don't see these loci anymore. And we actually don't detect these HP1 alpha enriched loci either, suggesting, although this is something we still have to investigate, that ATRX is really uh, important for guiding HP1 um, to these loci or maintaining it there. So uh, all in all, this is a very different um, cellular and chromatin behavior of these in-frame fusions. And we wanted to map them across the genome. So um, we had previously worked on ATRX in the context of um, um, different cancers and different cell lines. So we knew how to chip seek it, but we, we really wanted to look at it in the context of a wild type neuroblastoma. And what you can see here as expected is that a large proportion of 
ATRX is sitting at H3K9 ME3 enriched chromatin. Um, we're actually not including the uh, repetitive regions here. These are mostly um, genic regions. However, in the infrainfusion cell lines, I think you can appreciate that we lose that fraction of the genome. So ATRX is now more enriched at genes and promoter regions as shown here. And that was very interesting to us because it really suggested now that this protein, which is still hanging around in the cell, um, is actually moving across the genome, if you will, to more, um, let's say, euchromatic sites. Um, we showed that here, um, this movement to promoter regions, we see a decrease um, at regions that we had characterized ATRX to set at together with H3K9, which are the ZNF genes at their three prime exons. Um, they harbor a lot of uh, K9 trimethylation and ATRX um, we had shown also sits there. We lose that in the IFF setting. Um, the genes that are associated with the in-frame fusions also have higher expression levels as shown in the orange and red here. And um, if we map the ATRX in-frame fusion sites, we see that they're um, a bit more enriched for K27 acetylation, suggesting that these are more accessible and potentially active sites. Um, so we wanted to get a sense of um, the gene expression landscape of ATRX uh, neuroblastoma. And so again, we use these two age and stage mass cell lines as shown here in green and blue to characterize shared uh, genes that were up in the IFF setting or down in the IFF setting. Um, of course, we're really comparing apples and oranges here because these are cell lines, but we wanted to get some inkling into what these in-frame fusion neuroblastomas may be doing. Um, and in the up setting, if we look at those genes and pathways, we have a lot of extracellular um, matrix. Um, we also found cell migration. Uh, we actually validated this functionally that these cells are more migratory. In the down setting, we found uh, many uh, uh, neuronal type pathways such as synapses, uh, nerve impulses, postsynaptic membrane, et cetera, and importantly, neuron differentiation. So this already suggested that um, potentially the neuronal differentiation program in the IFF setting um, was enriched and that um, these cells really were not able to fully differentiate into neurons, which is of course classical of neuroblastoma. Again, if we just look at pathways, this is GSEA analysis, we saw the increased cell migration and decreased neuronal systems. So taking a, a real good look at these genes, um, we were very excited because there's lots of interesting genes that are differential between the wild type and the IFF setting. But one that really caught our eye was a transcription factor called REST, which I introduced to you earlier, which in the context of melanoma tends to sit uh, at specific PVAP only uh, regions of the genome. And again, that's something we're continuing to study. Um, so REST was upregulated, and you can see that as well at the protein level in these IFF cell lines. And many of its predicted targets, as shown here in red, were downregulated. So this suggested that the transcription factor REST was up, and it was silencing its targets in neuroblastoma. What was very interesting is when we looked at our chip sequencing for ATRX, we found that in the in-frame fusion setting, there was a peak at the REST promoter. So these in-frame fusion neuroblastoma sorry, the in-frame fusion ATRX proteins are actually sitting at the REST promoter, but not in the wild type setting. This is um, accompanied by K27 acetylation at the REST promoter, whereas K27 ME3, a silencing mark, is only found in the wild type setting, really coding the whole uh, REST locus. And you can see the expression uh, shown here uh, of, of the REST gene. And if we looked at the down-regulated genes um, and which transcription factors were predicted to regulate them, uh, REST clearly comes up, as does members of the PRC2 complex, such as SUS12 and EZH2. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So again, suggesting that this sort of neuronal um, differentiation program is suppressed in neuroblastoma. So what is REST? Uh, REST is a transcription factor, also called NRSF. It silences neuronal genes in non-neuronal tissue, and that's a sort of canonical function. It itself um, is mainly important for DNA binding. It has um, nine ZNF domains, which are also very interesting. 
And it works together with co-repressor complexes, both at its end and C terminus to, um, in theory, induce silencing. Um, so here are some of those members, uh, the co-rest complex, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there is evidence to think that rest works together with SWI sniff complexes, uh, shown here as BRG1, as well as other silencing uh, type of complexes. It's also been implicated to interact with uh, the polychrome repressive complexes. So in the cells that expressed rest, these two IFF cell lines, we chip seeked it. Uh, we found very nicely that it overlapped significantly the rest bound genes with uh, those genes that are down regulated in the IFF setting. So again, these neuronal genes that are being silenced, uh, we pulled out the rest motif. So that was obviously very satisfying from our chip seek. And when we plotted the K27ME3 enrichment at these overlap genes here, we found that in the in-frame fusion setting in red and orange, there's much more uh, K27ME3 signal. So again, suggesting uh, downregulation or silencing of the neuronal programs. And here's just a, an example, um, a snapshot of some of the K27ME3 data uh, at these downregulated genes. Again, the two IFF lines shown in red and orange, as well as a patient sample from St. Jude's that was um, um, kindly um, contributed by Mike Dyer, one of our collaborators at this story, who's at St. Jude. This was a patient at autopsy um, who we performed chip sequencing analysis on. And what you can see here at this locus is that uh, it's coded in K27 trimethylation, also uh, the patient sample, and this gene, which is uh, important in um, neuronal processes, is downregulated in uh, the neuroblastoma setting of the IFF. So uh, with that, we really wanted to see if we could find a target for um, this very rare and aggressive um, neuroblastoma subtype. And so we did a study, which I'm not gonna take you through all of the data, um, but we used various um, EZH2 inhibitors to try and alleviate this neuronal suppression. And so um, mainly I'm gonna focus on the TAS data. This is now FDA approved EZH2 inhibitor. Um, and of course, we tested both wild type and in frame fusion neuroblastoma cell lines. The mark is removed as expected. This takes some time, but the K27ME3 is turned over independent of the ATRX status. But there was differential sensitivity in the response to these inhibitors. So, uh, looking at proliferation and apoptosis, and again, this is really the work of uh, Zuleika Kadir, what she found is that the ATRX in frame fusion neuroblastoma stomas are highly sensitive to EZH2 inhibition. Um, some of that held true in the MYC N amplified subtype, and this is also shown by uh, Kim Stegmeier's group, uh, and those that are completely wild type and not MYC N amplified were not responsive. Um, and I should say one thing that's sort of very important is that in the context of neuroblastoma, the MYC N and the ATRX alterations are completely mutually exclusive events. Um, so this suggested that EZH2 inhibitor may be uh, a useful therapy for these patients. We performed also in vivo studies. Here we teamed up with Jan Jin and Miguel Segura um, to help um, synthesize the compounds. So Jan at our institute and Miguel for help with the uh, in vivo studies. We used um, a tool compound, UNC-1999, which is an EZH2 inhibitor. We saw decreased uh, tumor volume in the context of the in vivo studies. You can see that here uh, to the right and a tumor weight as measured below, as well as um, Western blot to show that this compound is actually on target and K27ME3 is down. So this was um, quite satisfying to see that we could have some effect in vivo. Uh, when we performed RNA-seq, uh, on cell lines now that have been treated with this inhibitor, we found um, that there are neuronal pathways that are sort of reactivated in the context of the drug. So uh, in the context of SKNMM, we see neural tube development and other um, neuronal type uh, pathways that are reactivated, but much more strongly in the case of CHLA-90, we see synap synaptic transmission, um, other pathways um, involved in neuronal um, processes. So that suggested that um, these cells were reactivating some of these genes that were involved in uh, neuronal differentiation. We also saw that in the context of the tumors. So the tumors that I had just shown you that were treated um, 
after um, harvesting them, we performed qPCR, and we can see that some of these targets also are now being reactivated in the context of EZH2 inhibitors. And so with that, we put forward a model that, um, and you know, this is something that's really still ongoing, is trying to understand what these in-frame fusion um, protein products are doing. And so um, in the context of neuroblastoma, at least, and these are really very unique to neuroblastoma, um, there are large deletions also in osteosarcoma, um, but they're much larger and they take out a very big portion of the locus. Um, and that's also very interesting to study. But we believe that these in-frame fusions are now mo moving across the genome um, to more open sites. How they do that and what they're working with um, is an area of investigation. Um, but effectively, we know that the rest um, transcription factors activated in this disease um, REST, in theory, is a repressive transcription factor. It silences neurogenesis genes. It does that in some cases together with EZH2, but we also found a class of genes that were independent of REST um, that were EZH2 or K27ME3 only. And when we remove either um, REST by depletion, so I didn't have time to show you that data, but we've also knocked down REST and shown that these cells actually um, have a very strong differentiation phenotype or use EZH2 inhibitors, we can sort of reactivate this neuronal gene expression program and these cells uh, either differentiate or um, undergo apoptosis in the presence of these inhibitors. Um, and so um, this is sort of the conclusion from that work, which was published in 2019, but we've really been trying to understand what is the direct role of this ATRX fusion protein. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, this, um, fusion or the mutations in ATRX is really distinct. So if we're looking at the different uh, neuroblastoma um, mutations or, or amplifications, you can see again, MCN is completely exclusive from ATRX. It's also interesting that TERP promoter mutations are also um, exclusive. ATRX has also been implicated in telomere biology. Maybe there's some overlap with the ALK mutation, but it's also rare. So, you know, what is, is this a driver and really, you know, how does it work? And in the previous study, we were using cell lines and we were, again, comparing sort of apples and oranges. We wanted to make an isogenic system to really study this when we only have one genetic mutation in these cells, which is the conversion of a wild type ATRX allele into an in-frame fusion. And so to do this, um, this work was actually spearheaded by Felix Rosamond, uh, now carried through by Zena and Anisha. We've generated an isogenic panel. I'm just gonna show you uh, some of that data today where we've um, genomically deleted, depending on the fusion that we wanna create, something like 40 KB uh, of, of the region to make these in-frame fusion protein products, um, which is, I'm just gonna show today the one to 11 fusion, which is representative in the SK and MM cell line. So, Again, effectively, we're taking a wild-type neuroblastoma cell line, as shown here. We're converting it by CRISPR uh, into an IFF protein, as shown here. And we've characterized these, and I'll just show you some of the data coming through on that. These are the 1 to 11 clones. Um, again, the wild-type setting, we see very nicely that it's ATRX in the wild-type setting is chromatin-bound. It's very insoluble. Um, whereas in the IFF setting, again, this is in the isogenic system, it's not in the insoluble fraction, it's actually coming out of the insoluble fractions, um, and also some of it is, is found in the cytoplasm, which we've seen before, and is actually a very interesting uh, question as to what this in-frame fusion may be doing out in the cytoplasm, but that's for another talk. And by performing RNA-seq on these different clones, you can see very nicely that the wild-type clones really cluster with the parental cell line, the in-frame fusions cluster away and together. And very reassuringly, these really do recapitulate what we find in the cell lines. So we have this uh, EMT signature I showed you earlier. Um, we have a strong migration phenotype. So we're interested in understanding if there's a mesenchymal uh, type of switching in these cells. Um, we've also come up with some interesting pathways that we hadn't seen before, including inflammatory response, which we think may be very interesting in the context of immunotherapy and potentially EZH2 inhibitor combination therapies. But also reassuringly, we've seen um, EZH2 targets downregulated as well as REST, although in this um, particular one was not significant. Um, so we now have a really nice system to dig in, I think, quite deep into the role of these in-frame fusions. 
using these isogenic models um, that Zena and Anisha have created. So with that, I think I went pretty fast to sort of catch up on time. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here today. Um, this is the lab um, pre-COVID, so we're missing a few folks here. Um, I think I've mentioned all the people along the way, and um, I'll also just thank our funding sources. Um, we're very fortunate to have both funding for melanoma and our neuroblastoma work, as well as moving towards clinical trials um, with uh, pediatric oncologists uh, using these EZH2 inhibitors, which we hope one day um, will be of use in these patients. And I thank you for your attention, and I'll stop there. Amazing, Emily. I'm going to uh, ask some questions from the group um, now. And the, the first question comes from Homan Chan. Uh, would PBAF loss in CCRCC similarly affect TGF beta's pathway invasive phenotype? That's an interesting question. So yeah, it's a really good point. In the context of um, renal cell carcino carcinomas, um, the PBAF subunit PBRM1 is frequently mutated. Um, we haven't directly looked at that. Um, we collaborated, in fact, though, with uh, Ramon Parsons' lab. We recently had a paper on PBRM1 in the context of renal cell. Um, in that case, I don't think the TGF beta was a big player. Um, and in fact, what's really interesting about these mutations is that in different cancers, they really have different effects. Um, so we're actually now studying PBRM1 in melanoma as well. Um, and um, I can hopefully give you the details on that at some point. We do think it's different than ARID2, um, but we don't think that these um, complexes have similar roles across different lineages, if I can put that shortly. Okay, so the next question for you is, do you check whether it has a high overlap of gain or loss of ATAC peaks related to genes and ARID2 targets? So PBRM1 is effectively not in the complex anymore, and it's likely degraded without ARID2. So it seems to be a stability issue of that complex. Um, so we didn't chip PBRM1 in the absence of ARID2. Yeah, so here it says, uh, most of the work is done in melanoma and neuroblastoma cell lines. Right. Are these results in agreement with patient tissue samples oh. as well for melanoma and neuroblastoma? Right. So... Um, it's a great question. I mean, we don't currently have, you know, all of the omics in melanoma tissues. Um, this is, you know, a pretty large effort to do in cell lines, and we'd have to collect a pretty good cohort of melanoma tissues to do that, um, to look for, you know, the effects of ARR2 mutations in tumor samples. So we haven't done that directly. We've correlated a lot of our data to the TCGA, which I didn't show you today. Um, and some of these pathways are indeed uh, held true in TCGA data. Neuroblastoma, forget about it. We'll just never be able to do that because it's so rare. Um, so again, we are part of large consortiums to try and um, collect these samples, but it's very slow going. Okay, this next question comes from, from Rich Tentori at Foghorn. Have you tested whether the in-frame uh, deleted ATRX is required for viability of those mutant lines? In yes, other it words, is. okay. <laughs> it is, yeah, they're required, yes. So this one um, comes from Benjamin Weekly. Hi, Emily. Fantastic talk. Thanks. Have you looked at the common AR1D2 mutations um, at the biochemistry? Uh, also, how can you see targeting treatment for patients with melanoma with these AR1D2 mutations? Okay, so I think I'll start with um, how do we treat them? Um, so yeah, the ARID2 mutations um, seem to be, at least in our hands, driving a more invasive type of, of biology. So one could think about using, you know, TGF beta inhibitors or other um, downstream targets um, to think about therapeutic approaches. Um, it may also help us, you know, understand because our two mutations actually can happen quite early in tumor progression. So we may need to monitor, you know, patients with our two mutations more carefully. Maybe they have a more invasive disease um, than if they don't have an hour two mutation. So these are things I think that we need to think about. Okay, so our next question, um, again, great presentation. Could you please give us your perspective on how SWI-SNF mutations in components such as ARID 
two D one A and Arid two D two, and Smark A four may influence the response to clinically evaluate inhibitors of ATR kinase. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. We haven't explored that one. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I think that was the last question, actually. So uh, thank okay. you. Thank you so much for this. Thank uh, you.